Hello and welcome back to another episode in the Lean Stacks Technology Education Series. In the last episode of the Spring Data Fundamental Series, we introduced the Flyway Database Migration Library. In this episode, I'll demonstrate how to integrate the Liquibase Library with Spring Boot. Liquibase has long been the de facto standard for Java application database portability. Liquibase models your database, your data, and changes over time into files called change logs. Change log files may be written in XML, YAML, JSON, or even SQL. Change log files contain one to many change sets. A change set is a discrete change to a database, such as creating or altering a table, inserting data, or many other types of operations. It's best to keep individual change sets small. Each change set is executed in an atomic transaction and recorded in an audit table within the database. Let's get started. I've opened the Greeting Web Services project in the Spring Tool Suite. You may find the complete source code illustrated in this episode by following the URL in this episode's description. Open the Maven POM file and add the Liquibase dependency. Notice the dependency version is omitted. Liquibase is part of the Spring Boot Bill of Materials. Spring Boot will automatically include the latest tested version of the Liquibase library into your project. When Spring Boot detects Liquibase on the application class path, it enables the built-in Liquibase auto configuration class, instrumenting the Liquibase library with sensible default values. Most of the default values will work nicely for the Greeting Web Services project. However, I want to make two changes. First, since I still have the Flyway library on my project class path, which is unusual by the way, usually teams will pick either Flyway or Liquibase, but not both. I don't want both Flyway and Liquibase to try to perform database changes simultaneously. So I will disable Flyway via configuration rather than removing the dependency from my project. Open the application.properties class, excuse me, file, and set the Flyway enabled property to false. Next, I want to override the location where Liquibase change log files are found. The auto configured default value is a class path location of db slash changelog slash db dot changelog master dot xml. This is the master changelog file. Since our project uses a top level class path directory named data, let's change the location of the Liquibase changelog master file to be the data changelog directory. In the application properties file, use the liquibase.change-log property to set the value. Finally, for the sake of consistency, let's add the liquibase enabled property, setting its value to true. This will mirror the flyway enabled property since we have both dependencies on our class path. Next, let's create change log files to instruct Liquibase how to create our database. One of the major differences with Liquibase is that it abstracts database operations into a language into a neutral language such as XML, YAML, or JSON. Using these formats to model database structure and content allows Liquibase to do the heavy lifting of translating and applying these instructions to specific database types. This is how Liquibase achieves database portability. You may define your database once, for example, in XML, and Liquibase will create your database in more than a dozen different types of relational databases. Remember, the source main resources directory serves as the root of the class path. Let's go to the data directory and create a new subdirectory named changelog. Within the changelog directory, create a new master changelog file named db.changelog-master.xml. 
To save some time, I'm going to copy and paste the contents of the master changelog file into STS. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the structure of changelog files. I'll provide a link to the Liquibase documentation in the episode's description below. The Liquibase documentation contains a reference for changelog file contents. One of the Liquibase best practices is to organize changelog files into meaningful sets of smaller files. If you continue to add change sets into a single changelog file, over time this file will become quite large. Refer to the Liquibase best practices document on their website for recommendations for changelog file organization. I have chose to create a single changelog file for each release of my application. In the master changelog file, I use the include statement to reference the class path location of each changelog file. The first entry is for release 0.0.1 of the Greeting Web Services application. Within STS, create a new changelog file in the data changelog directory named db.changelog-0.0.1.xml. I will copy and paste the contents of this changelog file for the sake of brevity. This changelog file contains eight change sets. A change set should, be, should include a small change to the database. Liquibase executes each change set within a transaction. As Liquibase applies each change set to a database, it stores the status of the change set execution into an audit table. The change set ID author, and the path of the changelog file create a unique key for each recorded change set. Change sets are executed in the order in which they appear within the changelog file, not by the name of the change set ID. This changelog file as a whole creates the greeting database and a small amount of baseline data. Next, let's create a second changelog file representing changes to the greeting database for a second release named 0.1.0. Create a new file in the data slash changelog directory named db.changelog-0.1.0.xml. Once again, I'll paste in the contents of this file for the sake of brevity. In this changelog file, we're simply adding a few more rows of data to the greeting table. We also need to update the master changelog file to include this release-specific changelog file. Return to the db.changelog-masterxml file. Add an include element referencing the 0.1.0 release changelog file. Make sure that the included files are listed in the order which Liquibase should execute them. Let's run the application to see Liquibase in action. First, I'll use Maven and run the unit test suite. The unit tests leverage HSQLDB and therefore will test that Liquibase properly creates and populates an HSQLDB database from our changelog files. All of our unit tests have passed, which indicates that Liquibase was able to create and populate the HSQLDB database correctly. Now let's run the application using the Spring Profile for MySQL. First, let's look at the MySQL greeting schema. Before we start the application, I'm going to drop and re recreate the greeting database schema. I want it to be completely empty so that Liquibase can apply all of the change logs from the first application version to the latest. Next, I'll start the application.
I'll use the java-jar command so that I may specify the MySQL spring profile on the command line. Let's take a look at the application logging statements in the console. Notice that Liquibase creates a high-level audit trail of its actions within the application log. This is a great tool for developers or systems operators during application releases to be able to review the, the execution of database changes by Liquibase. Let's return to MySQL. Notice that Liquibase has created the four tables used by the Greeting Web Services application and two additional tables. The first table, named Database Change Log Lock, contains a single row. This table is used by Liquibase to prevent multiple Liquibase processes from updating the database at the same time. Imagine that you're deploying a new software release to four servers and each instance of Spring Boot is started simultaneously or nearly simultaneously. We only want one of these applications to apply the new change logs to the database. The database change log lock table ensures that this will occur. The next table is named database change log. This table serves as an audit log for Liquibase. Liquibase scans this table to determine if a change set has already been applied to a database or if Liquibase needs to perform those changes. We know that all of our unit tests have passed against HSQLDB. To test MySQL, I'll simply run a few transactions using the Postman RESTful web service client. As we can see, the application appears to be behaving normally. Spring Boot includes a Liquibase actuator endpoint when Liquibase is enabled within the application. Using Postman RESTful Web Service Client, let's see what information is returned by that actuator endpoint. The response contains an array of JSON objects, each of which represents a change set executed by, the, by Liquibase. Essentially, this contains the content, contents of the database change log table. This actuator endpoint is a very useful tool for troubleshooting potential database integrity issues. Almost every software project utilizes a database. Managing the database upgrades that accompany a software release can be operationally challenging, especially when the software is implemented by a customer outside of your IT department, requiring precise and detailed instructions. By leveraging a database portability and upgrade library such as Liquibase, you can effectively streamline the software upgrade process and eliminate manual database upgrade steps from the implementation or upgrade procedure. Liquibase also provides your project with the flexibility of utilizing more than a dozen types of relational database technologies. If you're building software which is hosted on multiple customers' infrastructure, this flexibility may be appealing to your customers. By abstracting database modeling to an implementation neutral format such as XML, YAML, or JSON, application developers are able to author the database logic once rather than writing different SQL scripts for each type of database. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Click the thumbs up button below to let us know you liked it. Not a subscriber yet? Click the subscribe button below to get the latest episodes from LeanStacks. As always, you can find more information on LeanStacks.com. To view the complete repository illustrated in this episode, see the GitHub repository URL in this episode's description.